Welcome to A Therapist, The Buddhist in You, brought to you by The Recovery Collective in Annapolis, Maryland. Are you or someone you know grappling with the challenges of PTSD or anxiety? Have you been searching for a beacon of hope, a potential life-changing solution? Well, you're in for potentially a transformative journey today. We're about to dive deep into a groundbreaking treatment that holds immense promise for those seeking relief from the burdens of PTSD and anxiety. Imagine a treatment that could offer hope, a chance for healing, and a fresh start to individuals who have endured the weight of trauma. It's a remarkable modality called the stellate ganglion block, and we'll often call it SGB. And it's at the heart of our conversation today. This innovative procedure has the potential to be a game changer, and we're thrilled to explore its intricacies with an expert who has dedicated a large portion of his career to advancing the frontiers of people suffering from anxiety and traumatic. So now let's talk about why you should really listen closely, closely today. The SGB treatment has the power to not only alleviate psychological suffering, but also stop the physiological effects that often accompany post-traumatic stress disorder. This episode is not just for medical professionals. It's for anyone who is seeking inspiration and a deeper understanding of how this cutting edge treatment is reshaping lives. With that in mind, it's an absolute honor to introduce our guest today, Dr. James Lynch, co-founder of the Stellate Institute and a leading expert in the field. Dr. Lynch is a distinguished medical professional whose exper expertise spans in the fields of sports medicine, family medicine, and mental health advocacy. He is not only a respected physician, but also a former senior U.S. Army medical officer with over 31 years of exceptional leadership experience. Dr. Lynch's illustrious career has been marked by a deep commitment to the well-being of individuals. Whether they are elite athletes striving for peak performances, he's happened to work with the likes of Olympiad Michael Phelps, or soldiers facing the rigors of high-stress environments. His expertise, background in sports medicine, coupled with his fellowship training and board certification, has made him a sought-after figure in the medical community. With numerous publications and engagements at national and international medical conferences, Dr. Lynch is a true subject matter expert in the transformative field of medicine. Welcome, Dr. Lynch, and thanks for joining us today. Great. Great. Thanks for having me on, Luke. Yeah. So kind of let's jump right into it. You know, could you elaborate a little bit more? Let's start with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and, and the physiological effects. Just kind of start there for us, explain just a, a, a little bit about what happens to someone physiologically when they're experiencing trauma. Yeah, great, great question. I, I would, I would suspect that some folks listening to this have um, are experiencing some of these effects um, from from traumatic or stressful experiences in your past, and and maybe uh, experts in PTSD, whether you're on the receiving end or on the giving end of therapies and treatments. Um, and some of you may have heard uh, the term stellate ganglion block for the first time. And, and I'm going to preface this by saying th thank you for the introduction, too, by the way. But um, it, it, is, uh, it sounds like a little unusual the first time you hear it. And, and I wouldn't uh, fault anyone for raising their eyebrows when they hear about this procedure. Um, to me, the, the important thing is to understand the why and, and why it's helpful. And certainly, I think we'll get into the evidence published in the literature, the effects, the magnitude, and, and all of those things. But to me, the most important thing is understanding why, and why is some very simple procedure that's been around for 100 years that takes only a few minutes and is extremely safe and virtually painless, how does it work? So I, I think that's a, a really good question and a good place to start is, what are the effects? And, and with, uh, with the physiologic effects that can come from a traumatic experience, it's important to understand the, the anatomy of the sympathetic nervous system, which most people are familiar with is the fight or flight system. And the, the anatomy is actually a really important part. And um, we, this is something we've known for a very long time. And we have really good anatomy dissections that go back over 100 years that show this. But um, there's a nerve that's located in the side of the neck called the cervical sympathetic chain or cervical sympathetic trunk that runs on both sides of the neck. Um, this nerve has one function, and its sole function is it governs the sympathetic nervous system. 
So in terms of the physiologic responses that we have to stressful experiences or threatening experiences or traumatic experiences, most of those experiences are governed by the cervical sympathetic chain. And, it, and it, the, the um, easiest way that I describe it to me, this, this very simple is the term, the trunk, the cervical sympathetic trunk, which runs in the neck is to me just like the trunk of a tree. So within the brain, there is the central autonomic network, which is um, several locations in the brain, anatomical locations. The primary one is really the amygdala, which is the fire alarm of the brain. Uh, many of you may be familiar with that. Maybe many of you know of that as the amygdala being really the, the fear and threat center of the brain. But the amygdala has to communicate to the body somehow. And this is, to me, the thing that many, many of my patients over the years have um, missed through no fault of their own, but maybe just nobody's really explained this to them before. And then candidly speaking, a whole bunch of my colleagues in medicine, clinicians of various types um, have kind of missed this as well. But the signal from the amygdala and the central autonomic network has to get to the body somehow. So as far as the physiologic responses from the neck down that your body has, they have to get there. And they don't get there through a rush of adrenaline in the, in the endocrine system or through a Bluetooth connection, which is, I know, kind of a snarky thing to say, but people enjoy that. It just travels the hardwired right down a nerve in the neck. And uh, this is uh, pretty straightforward. It has to be that way because it has to be so fast to protect us. And if our responses to a threat were not immediate and reflexive, we, we would die. We would not exist. And our species would not have made it this long. So the physiologic responses that we have to your question, Lou, are many of the things that we're familiar with. If, if we've ever experienced driving down the highway, looking down at your phone when the person in front of you slams on the brakes and boom, your body instantly goes into fight or flight mode. Hmm. And everyone's familiar with this in one shape or another because we all experience it. Some of us experience it way more often than we would like to. But many of us have experienced this as a natural response. So your heart races, your muscles clench, your lungs fill with air, your sweat glands fire. All of those things happen in an instant when you have a traumatic response. And for many people, those same responses of muscle tension, sweating, um, an angst or an anxious sensation in your chest or your gut, those are things that per can persist. And for some people, they'll persist an entire lifetime and they may have been their sense as old as somebody can remember without the, the actual ability to, to experience calm. Hmm. So that's really the physiologic response to your question, Luke. But to yeah. me, the important part is, is the connection there that I think we'll come back to in a second. And before we do that, that's a great example, whether it's the car response where you slam on the brakes or you lean far too far back and you get that, that feeling and that flesh feeling. What yeah. happens when someone has whether it's diagnosable trauma, well, let's say diagnosable trauma, what happens to the sympathetic, parasympathetic, the amygdala that you mentioned? So people understand in, in a basic way, what's the difference between that um, healthy response and the chronic potential chronic trauma response that, that yeah. what, what's the difference there? Yeah, it's, it's a perfect question because um, I think that's really at the root of this particular therapy and why it works so well for many people is um, the normal response then for our body is to sense that there's a threat through our senses. Then the, the brain and the central autonomic network then has to get the body to do something. Fight, flight, freeze. Those are your options. And the, the signal is going to travel to the body to do that. But the, the, the key part of the anatomy and the physiology of the sympathetic nervous system is that the nerve that I described that travels, which is essentially just like the trunk of the tree, has the nerves that travel in both directions. So to me, I always picture a highway like I-95 or something, and there's cars driving by mm -hmm. in both directions. Because as soon as the threat travels down the chain to the body, it hits a massive root network. And it spreads out to it travels, the sympathetic nervous system travels along all your nerves, your sensory nerves, your blood vessels, down to every little hair on your, on your mm -hmm. arm, all your sweat glands and all your muscles. But the key thing is once that happens, the body has an initial response. If there's a threat, the signal travels right back up the body again, again, right through this, what we consider an anatomic funnel. 
where all the signals travel right through the neck and right back up to the amygdala and the rest of the central autonomic network. And that's where that uh, part of the brain then can build and learn what is threatening and imprint on the brain. These are threatening experiences, danger. This is bad. Get away from it. And, and that is um, really a, a deeper level than what happens in the rest of the brain. But at a very basic level, that's where the, the beginning of the imprinting happens. Hmm. As soon as the signal travels back up to the amygdala, the brain, the central autonomic network bounces it right back down the neck and it tells the body, stay switched on. Threat is present. And for most people, that will extinguish very rapidly. You know, as soon as you recover from slamming on your brakes and you pick your french fries up off the floor and put your phone back like, and you wow. a few breaths <laughs> and you calm down, mm -hmm. for most people, that system will reset and be just fine. For others, it does not. And for the others that it does not, you know this, like you can feel it. There's something the matter where that has not reset totally. And there may be just a little bit of an edge or a hair trigger to your sympathetic nervous system where you may experience a similar type of zero to 60 response for something that should not provoke you that much. And this manifests in a lot of different ways. And, and some of the more common things that people can relate to is, is anger and irritability where you just may fly off the handle at something. And the second you do, you realize I should not have done that. And that was inappropriate. You may even lash out at people you love. This is a very common thing. You immediately realize that it was wrong. You feel bad and shame and guilt on top of everything else. And this, this is a manifestation of having the sympathetic nervous system in a position where it's fed back on itself and then remain elevated. So, so this is an impersonal way to describe it, but I do feel it's a little bit like saying there's like a circuit or a loop that develops because that's how we were developed as long as the threat is present to stay awake and alert. And that's what's allowed us to survive. So that's our natural setting until it's extinguished, then it goes down. But it doesn't take much to keep that loop perpetuated and then to essentially hardwire, again, lack of a, of a better term, to, to grind a loop into that response that's then dysfunctional, frankly, and then it just doesn't work properly. Mm -hmm. So I started this, this, the introduction that this is a groundbreaking form of treatment or modality. You've also yeah. said it's been around for 100 years, <laughs> okay, yeah. or, or decades. Um, so let's, it's interesting because I'm hyping. There's a reason why I want you here, the Collective Solution to Health and Wellness. And I think the, the, the listeners are going to find out, wow, there's huge benefit to this as we dive deeper into the physiological aspects that your treatment, the SGB, how we block this, and then how holistic services help. But like, we'll also talk about, wait a minute, it's groundbreaking. It's been around for decades and decades. What are you talking about? So let's, let's get into it. What yeah. is the stellate ganglion black treatment? What are yeah. you doing? How does it help? Yeah. What the heck is this thing we're referring to? <laughs> yeah. Let me describe yeah. it. Um, please, for, for you watching, this is a very simple procedure. It's actually an injection. It's a nerve block. Um, a nerve block is a simple injection of anesthetic agent around a nerve that puts the nerve to sleep. It's the same thing the dentist does when they put a nerve to sleep before a dental procedure or before somebody has to do stitches or some other procedure. It's using a medication that is very simple. And in this case, we use a medication called ropivacaine, which has been around a very long time. It's in the same family of things like novocaine or lidocaine. It's just an anesthetic and there's nothing mixed in with it. What the procedure consists of is numbing the nerve that runs in the neck. So I already made reference to this nerve, the highway with the cars buzzing both ways. That carries a signal that um, is the entire uh, sympathetic nervous system from the brain through the entire body. By numbing the nerve, all what that means is, and the term block can be a little misleading, but what that means is just put the nerve to sleep. And in this case, for eight hours, which is about how long ropivacaine lasts. So what, what would that do? Just putting a nerve to sleep for eight hours um, mm -hmm. has a benefit. And this is something that we've known for many years in pain medicine. By, by putting a nerve to sleep, you can potentially break a circuit that it's perpetuating in. And this is something that's been used for a long time in things like complex regional pain syndrome or phantom limb pain. So this, 
this is not a new technique. The, the procedure itself has been performed since the 1920s. And it looked like this. Touch the bone in the side of the neck that's right here. And then without any guidance, no ultrasound, no x-ray, no nothing, the doctors would inject right next to their finger. This was performed like this. It would take literally a minute. And it, would, it was performed like that from the 1920s for many, many years until fluoroscopy was invented. And then now it's um, used more safely using ultrasound. But this, is, this will give you an idea of how simple this procedure was. And mm -hmm. even back then, it was known that by targeting the sympathetic nervous system, there could be great benefits and things call, that we call sympathetically mediated pain. And that's really what the procedure was used for and is still used for to this day in many places is for some very specific pain syndromes. But what happened is about 12 years ago, a couple of us were um, investigating better ways to treat PTSD. And it happened to be that I was in the military working with a good colleague of mine who happens to be my current partner and co-founder, a doctor named Sean Mulvaney. Both of us were in the special operations community and known each other for years stationed at different places. And Dr. Mulvaney was the one who had um, discovered that this procedure had been used and had some benefit in treating PTSD. And um, really, we, we started doing some research early on and um, brought this treatment into the special operations community in the military in a very small few circles and found um, immediate and great anecdotal success. But anecdotes aren't much. So we really started peer-reviewed, evidence-based publications over many years to, to show that this was helpful. Um, but the, the fact that the procedure has been around for a hundred years and was performed blind, as we say, by touching the bone is a very mm -hmm. reassuring thing to a lot of people because in this day and age, there are many new treatments coming out and, and many good ones and many promising ones for sure. But a lot of people's first question will be, well, what are the long-term effects of this? Um, I love when people ask me that question because I say, well, I'll tell you what, we have a hundred years worth of data on the stellate ganglion block and it was performed safely for, for um, scores of years without any guidance. Mm -hmm. So it's a very nice um, um, feeling for people to know this has been, we have really good long-term data, safety data, and it's a very safe and simple procedure that only takes a few minutes. And then the next question most people say is, well, why the heck didn't we figure this out sooner? Or why is it not more well-known? And, um, you know, maybe part of that is, is why we're doing this podcast. But the, um, the procedure is quite simple when performed under ultrasound. It takes me maybe about five to seven minutes. And I happen to go slowly and want to make sure patients are nice and comfortable. And it's virtually painless, like I said. But it really consists of about a five to six, seven minute procedure of a little injection in the side of the neck using a tiny little needle and some numbing medicine. Um, there are different techniques to do this, but we generally block about where I'm pointing at the C6 level. And then what we do more standardly now is treat at both the C6 and the C4 level um, on the right side, typically first. We also discovered that there is a benefit of of treating on the left side as well, which is a little deeper discussion. But the, the basic question is, what is a stellate ganglion block? It's a simple injection in the side of the neck using a local anesthetic to numb the nerve that controls the fight or flight system. And by putting it to sleep for eight hours and letting it wake up, it wakes up in a less excited state or in a, in a, um, a broken loop from that loop of hyperarousal that has been established. There it is. An injection can um, dissipate or even get rid of the physiological fight or flight response that's involved with trauma, right? Yeah. And I, I, I think um, it's probably worth noting that uh, when we perform the procedure, so it's literally done in our office setting, you know, with a, in a typical doctor's office setting. Some other places do it in an operating room with other um, techniques. Um, but in our clinic in Annapolis, Maryland, we perform it in the office setting safely. I've been doing this for 13 years on lots of people, and, and it takes a few minutes. I like to spend a lot of time with people ahead of time to explain a lot of the why and then sit with people afterwards. So I've been able to learn a lot um, over the years from my patients and the therapists that we, we share um, patients with. 
But what people will feel mm -hmm. is something typically within a few minutes, which is the first question is, hey, when is this thing going to start working? And because it's a nerve block, the nerve goes to sleep fairly quickly. And there's actually something that shows up on the face, a physical symptom that shows us the nerve is going to sleep because on the side we block the nerve, the eye will droop a little bit and the pupil will get smaller and a few other things, which is a thing called Horner syndrome. The nice thing with that is it's a beautiful physical symptom or a sign that we can look at that shows that the nerve is going to sleep. And eight hours later, it goes back to normal. Eye opens up, the pupil goes back to the normal size. But it's a confirmation then that the block was performed um, properly and successfully. And right around then is when people will actually start, start to feel something different. And there's a variety of things that people will feel, but some of the words that I hear are physiologic symptoms within a few minutes, like I feel lighter or calmer or my muscles have relaxed or melted, people will say. And then even in thoughts, many people will say, my thoughts feel clearer or quieter. Those are really the two words that I hear frequently. Several times today, people said, my thoughts are quieter. As the sympathetic nervous system goes to sleep, there's effects then on the physiology where the body will relax, but the thoughts will relax as well. And many people feel emotional and cry after the procedure. Um, so there's, me, there's, a, a, there's a real physical thing going yeah. on. And to me, that's an example of chicken or the egg. I, I don't care what came first, right? So if you can quiet the mind and the body calms down, or if you can calm the body and then the mind calms down, the body is to me the most magnificent puzzle. We're connected, the, the mind, body, the, the thoughts are affected by emotions and the physical aspects, the somatic aspects can affect the, the thoughts and the emotions. And to me, your example is just that. This procedure appears to, it, empirically, you've got plenty of research, you've got anecdotally that when you do this injection, people with this kind of chronic circuitry of fight or flight response, physiologically at least, certainly, what we'll talk about too is the psychological it slows the physical symptoms and you're explaining that people what today in your in your procedures their mind begins to quiet down what a relief what a relief yeah. um i've talked to you i wanted to get you in this podcast because no brainer to me <laughs> right that this form of treatment can help people with acute complex trauma, um, intensive anxiety, this can help people treat them, recover, and even heal. This is one aspect to it. Talk, talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, I think, I think, I suspect there's probably a few people that sound like, you know, and I'll be candid here. The first time I heard about this was many years ago and I, I stopped listening. I thought it was a little weird and it didn't really make sense to me. I couldn't get my head around how can a shot in the neck help treat PTSD? It just seemed weird. There was nothing sure. consistent with how I had been trained. And I pride myself. I'm an evidence-based physician. I do evidence-based medicine. And um, so I, I suspect that there are people, it just seems a little too weird. And, and and frankly, some people will just say, it just sounds too good to be true. And I've had plenty mm -hmm. of patients who have said, it sounds too good to be true until they eventually have heard enough other people's testimonials or heard of, have a friend that's experienced it before they finally step forward and say, okay, mm -hmm. I'm here, I'm here to get some help. Um, but the point that you made, I think is really important to me is that this is not a standalone procedure for me. There may be some other physicians who perform the procedure who may look at the stella ganglion block as some kind of a thing you do that fixes everything or or something like that. But that that to me has never been my my attitude. And I have always practiced as part of a team. And most of what I've learned about how I, I treat um, my patients, I've learned from, from therapists and my patients themselves over the years. So to me, what the block does is it allows someone to disconnect that circuit, stop this signal that goes brain to body, body to brain, um, reflexively, meaning instantaneously, so that your responses are no longer in your control. And the, the slow driver in the left lane makes you lose your mind and you don't seem to have any control over it. 
or your kid drops a plate or spills something and you completely lose your mind and you have zero control over it. And these are these are common things, but certainly not the only things. Um, what I think the block does is it buys you some some headspace and a little bit of leg room by disconnecting that immediate response. And, and what that does is it doesn't make the world perfect. It doesn't make the driver and the, sl the slow driver in the left lane no longer annoying because because that's not going to happen. <laughs> um, what it what it allows you to do is not go zero to sixty and lose your mind, and what mm. it does do is it cracks the door open. I think really nicely for some good gains in therapy. And and what I've experienced in in my profession is that there are many people who are trying their hardest to get into therapy or through therapy or dig into some difficult things, and it's just physically too painful or uncomfortable. Or difficult to do it because you don't have the bandwidth in your head because you're dealing with too many other things. So what I look at the block as being is a tool, just like other tools in therapy, that will allow you to dial down the, the immediate and uncontrollable sympathetic response or fight or flight um, and take away the, the angst and the on edge feeling in your body that many people with anxiety have. And then allow you to really dig into therapy or, or frankly, make some lifestyle changes. And that, that comes up, you know, people will treat anxiety as many of us know, um, other ways. And, you know, substance abuse is a really obvious one. And there's some, it's actually like, you know, I, I dare to say almost virtually acceptable that people will say, like, I have a couple of drinks or something before I go into this public setting or something. Mm -hmm. Um, what can happen is if we can dial down um, that angst or that anxiety that comes from something and the something um, doesn't matter. I'll come back to that. But if we can sure. dial that down, it may be the kind of thing that allow people to make some better healthy choices and engage in therapy. So I see this as, as complementing, um, not replacing what other people are doing. You're not saying that this is a cure to cure the high in, hyper in, like, intense anxiety or PTSD. So I imagine a lot of people are are going, well, how long does it last? How long does this last? If you do, you do this SGB, this injection, mm -hmm. what, what is the range for people to, um, have these some physiological symptoms? Y yes. Maybe the, the, the brain calms down, but specifically the block, how long does the physical symptoms tend to dissipate or be gone completely from PTSD yeah. and anxiety? So there's a, a ton of individual variation in, in responses. So um, these are this is based on many of our publications in the peer-reviewed literature, as well as years of anecdotal experience of taking care of people. But um, a couple of things: the um, the top three symptom cluster type things that are um, helped by a stellar ganglion block when we study the effects of specific symptoms is probably anger and irritability, number one, also sleep and concentration, which is weird mm. if you think about that. But both of those things have a huge impact on other things. And both of them have a lot of things that impact them. But those are, those are some of the high yield um, benefits. Now, if you look at all your symptoms and you total up the scores, whether it's your anxiety score or your PTSD score, and we look at the numbers when we publish this data, about 85% uh, of people with a single right-sided stellate ganglion block will have a 50% drop in symptoms the next day. So mm -hmm. this is this usually will make people's eyebrows go up because there's there's nothing else that does that. It's just, it sounds- Cut in half. I, Cut I in openly half. admit that. Yeah. It, it clearly does. And if you look at the literature over over- 20 something original research published in the peer reviewed literature, it's fairly consistent. And whether we're looking at anxiety scores on a GAD 7 or PTSD scores on a PCL 5 or a PCL M back before when we were using DSM 4. And these are just uh, measurement one. tools just for the listeners. Yep. Yeah, I'm sorry. So just measurement tools with numbers associated with them, we really see a 50% reduction in total symptoms. And when I say the next day, I mean, people literally will feel better within a few minutes to a few hours. The big question that you ask though is, okay, that sounds wonderful. How long does it last? It can be all over the place, frankly, but there are people that I treated over 10 years ago that 
did fine, like really well after a single treatment. And they, um, what's key to say, first of all, is um, what matters most is what you do afterwards, right? After the block. So um, we'll get we there. Know, we'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> yeah. We all know that life matters. Um, so it's yeah. hard to predict what will, mm-hmm. what everybody will do. But why don't I just say that most people will get about a six month to 12 month relief when I say a 50% drop in symptoms, mm-hmm. six months to 12 months would be like a bulk of people. There are people who will get relief for much longer, meaning uh, one and done or many years. There are some people who will get relief for a long time and then they might hit a rough spot, whatever that is, marital, financial, substance abuse, another triggering event, significant, something like that. There are some people that may require more than one treatment. I I think that's important to say because I've had people ask me that and and this is possible. And there are people with very, 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 very significant deep-rooted symptoms who have been experiencing um, daily the angst of anxiety despite many other therapy attempts. And sometimes it might take um, a few treatments to actually break through that chain. Um, That can be difficult to predict who that is sometimes experiences earlier on childhood lasting for a very long time can be a little more refractory. Um, but there isn't a particular type of trauma or level of symptoms that the block has not been shown to be helpful for. I actually had someone that um, I treated today or yesterday, a great response for about three years and then had a significant um, life event. And you know, like I say, uh, life happens. They were doing great, hit a rough spot. We're doing all the right things, but things just kind of bubbled back up on them. And they called and said, hey, can I come back and do the thing again? I said, mm-hmm. by all means, come on back. And and what we know and what we found in our, our research is that subsequent blocks are equally effective. So there's not this kind of thing like medications where you have to increase the dose or you develop resistance or tolerance. And, and in fact, the the stellate ganglion block, when it's used for other things, like um, there's some cardiac conditions or some other pain conditions, you can actually repeat it safely. I know it sounds crazy, but you could do it every other day for a couple of weeks. It's that mm-hmm. safe. Um, so there's not like a limit to how many you could do because it'll wear off or something like that. It's just a It's not block. eroding the nervous system. It's not eroding the muscles, the ligaments. It's, it's, it's an yeah. injection that numbs it. Yeah. yeah it's if a I could question. paint a, and if I could paint a picture for people, imagine your nervous system being in the emergency room, and it's that paramedic, that fight or flight response, and that's part of the nervous system, and specifically the ganglion block is it can reduce some of those symptoms in half. So, and this is where I get juiced up, and you're you're taking me there, which I'm glad you were. You talked about anger, irritability, affecting sleep and concentration. What about hyperarousal? Oh, yeah. When you look, so um, hyperarousal, if we look at the whole cluster E of the of the um, category of PTSD, they have to do things with startle response, feeling on edge, um, the, the jumpiness, irritability. High alert. Yeah, just feeling on edge all the time. That hyperarousal, that cluster is the one that's most impacted by Stelly Gang and Block. That's been fairly so now, consistent. So now what you were saying, which I love, which got me so excited to talk to you. When you receive this treatment and you've been suffering <laughs> from this response, this physiological response, this um, hyper around this heightened state, and all of a sudden that is cut in half. Can you imagine the type of treatment and therapy and work you can do in therapy when you don't have that hyper arousal? Powerful hyper vigilance, that yeah. exaggerated sense of threat and danger, that hyper vigilance and constantly scanning your environment and not feeling secure, all of a sudden that hypervigilance goes down. And can you imagine you have a level of a little bit more comfort increased in, by 50% so you can address whether it's complex, whether it's an acute, a single case, big T trauma, and you can begin to address that in therapy. Disassociation. 
<laughs> you see where I'm going here? Yeah. Talk talk on that a little bit. Keep going. Yeah, yeah actually, j just to, to dovetail on that, um, I, I have been performing this procedure now for almost 13 years. I um, have presented on it, discussed with, I can't tell you how many hundreds of therapists over the years from a variety of places where I've lived and been stationed, where I've worked. And currently people fly in from all over the country and several other countries to our clinic in Annapolis. So I interact with a lot of people, um, therapists who refer their patients here. What I can't figure out is those who are not. And and I I, I get it. Like I understand that it sounds different and sounds a little bit weird, but it's almost universal, I think, to me, when I treat somebody and they go back to their therapist, which is what they do, because I refer everybody to do that, they go back and they engage in therapy and they get better and um, they're pleased and their therapists are happy. And then they refer somebody else because they think, oh my God, this is great. We were kind of stuck and we were rehashing things and we couldn't get past a certain point. So, um, you know, candidly speaking here, because I don't know who's going to listen to this, but it's been a little surprising to me of the therapists just around our area where where we are here in Annapolis mm -hmm. that were around the Delaware, Virginia, Maryland, D.C. area, that there aren't more people that share patients with us. When I have had people fly from New Zealand, I have yeah. two people driving down from Canada today or this week. So I, I, it's a little bit, there's some mystery to me why there's not more collaboration here. And I, I think, I think the, our patients, I think people who are suffering ought to demand that. Like, I think this is one of those things where I want my doctors to reach across and collaborate and find different things that can help me um, if they exist and that that type of teamwork should be, um, should be the norm that that should be the kind of thing that I would expect. So, um, I do you've think explain, you've explained the safeness, the efficacy, the ethical, the, the years and decades of empirical research that shows not only the safeness, but the redu the reduction in symptoms. Now we're now talking about how this can augment the next step, which is the therapy process. Why not? Right. And maybe yeah. that will change because we're seeing such well around here, because we're surrounded by Johns Hopkins and all these research centers and NIH and all these places that are, are doing, um, you know, micro dosing in different forms mm -hmm. to potentially do the same thing for trauma. Now, in some ways it's a, a a very quick injection, a very safe injection, in some ways, really not invasive <laughs> in terms of not mind altering. It's yeah. just um, numbing to, to allow the ability to rewire the brain through therapy and a reduction in symptoms yeah. and, and, and give it the ability to the mind and body to begin to process in a different way where it was in that fight or flight response. And you can add to it by adding therapy to it. Wow. Yeah. I, I, so it's, it's funny, I guess, you know, we, you said this at the intro, but, uh, I'm not a psychiatrist. Um, my training, my, my basic training, um, is in family medicine. And like many people watching know that, that a great deal of, of psychiatric and behavioral health care is delivered by family medicine docs across our country. Um, so that, that's really where I got a lot of experience, but, but I see things slightly different than a psychiatrist or a psychologist. I think I just, I see things at a little different angle. And I think in family medicine, what I learned really early on is as a, as kind of a primary care provider or clinician for people is that, that uh, medicine is a team sport. Like you got to figure out who else can do what for your patient and figure out how to reach over and consult people and learn new things and stay up on the science. And it's, it's not easy. It's very, very hard. And in my opinion, there's a, a lot, a not enough of that um, teamwork in medicine these days. There's a lot of barriers that prevent that. Um, but I think um, another point that I see is that with some of the newer things coming out, and I'm glad you mentioned that because there's some wonderful things going on at Johns Hopkins or at Shepherd Pratt in terms of newer cutting edge therapies. And I think there's a lot of excitement when you hear about something new and people are really asking questions like, Hey, how do, how does, how does that work and how will it work? Um, and I, I think it's great. I think there are some very promising things coming, 
But, appropriate but I mean, excitement. We'll, yeah, appropriate yeah. excitement for it. Yeah. It's legit, I think. Um, but then I, I'm quick to remind people that uh, the Stelly Ganglion block ain't new. Like, it's not one of those things. In fact, it's been around a while. And look in the literature. There's over 20 peer-reviewed original research articles that already show that it works. So it's not one of the, like, next thing coming. You know, I think that people will always be looking for another level one study and someone to do a meta-analysis at some point. And those things will happen. We're currently doing a randomized control trial with Ohio State um, and our clinic that's combining cell ganglion block with CPT or, or cognitive processing therapy. So we're going to continue to do research. We're going to continue to publish our evidence. Um, but I, I think that uh, while some people are looking for what is the best answer, I think that's the wrong question to be asking. I think it's really like what combination of things work best for the individual in front of me right now. And and, and for some people, just without even talking about anxiety, but for the, the diagnosis of PTSD, um, some people will call it PTSI. You'll hear that terminology, but as, as far as DSM is concerned right now, post-traumatic stress disorder, the thing that is horrifying, if you haven't heard this before, is how heterogeneous that can be. But if you look at the criteria that can give you the diagnosis of PTSD, there's 636,000 variations of symptoms that all mm. equate to PTSD. I'll, I'll mm. say it again, 636,000 variations. It's really, like it'll blow your mind. You have to go through and get a math genius to show you that that's actually accurate. But if you look at it and you say, okay, if there's that much heterogeneity in this particular diagnosis, and we're looking at evidence-based research to show what treatments work best or better, it's almost an impossible task. Not like we shouldn't do it or we shouldn't try, but it really begs the question of how do I apply or generalize the, the data that I can read in the peer-reviewed literature to the person sitting in front of me who's suffering. How do I treat that person? And I, I don't think it's as black and white as many other areas of medicine. And we know this. And I don't think we should try to do that too hard because the brain is not a femur. And we don't treat PTSD right. like we treat hypertension. They're very, very different. And then I, I think that gets lost on some people and they're looking for the the best thing for everyone or the number one type of therapy. And I, I think that's the wrong way to go after it. Yeah. And, and one thing that you're, you're certainly not saying, and I'll, I'll say this, we're often a quick fix society. So what is the pill? What is the medication to get rid of my symptoms? Well, <laughs> this, this modality reduces significantly the symptoms for up to months and years. But what you're so clear on is that this augments the overall treatment process to actually minimize, reduce, or, or not just recovery, but healing in a way that can be so profound. And to me, that is what integrative treatment, that is what holistic care and treatment is and should be. And I want to touch on just this in terms of after you get this SGB, this injection, and your mind slows down and the symptoms cut in half, if not more, the emotional dysregulation, this trauma, this intense anxiety can lead to difficult emotions and regulation. And if that's gone and these overwhelming emotions, and you said anger and irritability, well, who wants to process when you're anger? It, for me, I, I always say anger is a secondary emotion, meaning you got to feel something before anger. So anger can be somewhere you can direct it and project it outwards. Well, if that is gone, it creates a pretty good environment to uh, you know, do therapy and you won't be flooded in the therapy session. And then all of a sudden you can process and begin and create this change in your life when that emotional dysregulation might be minimized significantly. I'm just like, I hope people are listening and going, this is a wonderful first, second step to, to long-term healing that they get to um, have some power in. It's just not a pill. It's just not a surgery. It's an augmented form of holistic integrative treatment. Yeah. I think That's there, are, there, 
Yeah, no, I think there there are people that come um, to see me and they they specifically want to get off their medications. And and I'm very clear that I say I'm not. That's not my business as not sure. your prescribing clinician to wean you off your medications. Um, and yep. then, but they'll ask, is, is that possible? And yeah, it's absolutely possible because because people do it all mm-hmm. the time, and they write me a letter afterwards and say they did. But it's under very careful overwatch by their prescribing Treatment clinicians. Team. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Um, however, many people will come and I'm actually amazed at how many people will come that have been on benzos for years. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's, I get it. It's a, it's a useful class of medications, but it's not without risk. And it's a little surprising that, that there are people that are on for a long time and, and it's, it's just, uh, you know, again, I don't want to. Dr. Lynch. Don't get me going. I can get passionate about that topic and <laughs> be oversubscribing, prescribing, and and. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to. I guess I'm trying to walk the fine line of I, I prefer not to yeah. um, badmouth anybody else's particular way of treating things. What I can say is there are things that have been used historically that people continue to use just because they don't know that there's another way of doing things. Sure. And again, I I think I'll I'll you know I'll make the point that I think if you're involved in treating complex diagnoses like post-traumatic stress disorder, which is extremely Absolutely. complex, and you're not keeping up with the literature, and you're calling yourself a trauma expert, you're not mm-hmm. a trauma expert. And, and I see right. it out there because mm-hmm. there are people that are out there that call themselves experts in things, and, and maybe they have great experience, and maybe they are specialists in certain areas, but to be an expert in something, you better know everything about it. Which doesn't mean you have to ascribe to it all. You certainly don't. That doesn't mean that at all. But you certainly Mm -hmm. have to be aware of what's in the the published literature. And you can't say, well, I've never heard of that. If something's been published multiple times, including, you know, level one evidence in JAMA psychiatry. So, you know, I I hear that all the time. And it makes makes me ruffle up a little bit when people Mm -hmm. are using, in my opinion, antiquated techniques and just not keeping up with the science. And they say things like, oh, I, I, I haven't heard of that before. I think, well, pick up a journal, you know, like we, your clients are counting on you, your patients are counting on you to keep up with, keep up with what's going on and not just doing what you learned in school many years ago. So, you know, that may ruffle someone's feathers. You may take offense to me saying that, but I, I mean it. And I think our, our patients should demand that. I think it's exceedingly hard to do that. But but th- that's what being a good clinician is all about. And, and it's also and what if, being a good teammate clinician is all about because I can't expect to know everything. I rely on something that you're going to tell me, Luke, by some new thing that I've never heard of. So that's where that comes in as well. And if clients in this country can watch a commercial about a medication that says, ask your doctor. <laughs> yeah. I think it's completely okay to go to your therapist, your 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 doctors to go, Hey, I heard about this thing called the cellate ganglion block. Do you know anything about it? There's been many times in my career that I've gone, you know, I need to look in that. I don't know. And, yeah. and if we can do that for medications, we can do Me that too. for <laughs> different forms of potential treatments that, that can benefit collective solution to health and wellness. That's what we're all about. Yeah. I have two kind of more questions before we, we wrap up. And thanks for being with me today, Dr. Lynch. Um, I can just only imagine there's some people going, well, I don't think I have PTSD, but I, I've got this anxiety yeah. and I don't think I have to the level of panic attacks or, or I've had panic attacks. Well, you see where I, what I'm getting at. There's a full, yeah. um, spectrum of anxiety and stressors and triggers that people have and whether they've been diagnosed or not, whether they've yeah. had panic attacks or anxiety attacks, you know, can I be a, a candidate for this form of treatment? Yeah, great question. So um, a couple of months ago, we published our, our study on ang- PTSD, on Stella ganglion block for anxiety. So uh, independent of PTSD. And and again, I, I said this earlier, but just to, to refresh, um, the Stella ganglion block is extremely effective for uh, anxiety. And what we looked at is a, uh, what kind of a, drop is that on, on the score. Again, the metrics that we use to measure that. So the Generalized Anxiety Disorder 7 or the GAD7 score sheet, what's considered a, uh, the minimal clinically important difference or what we call the MCID is agreed upon a successful treatment is if you can change the 
the GAD7 score by four points or greater. You can drop a GAD7 score by four points. That's a pretty good drop mm. in anxiety um, from whatever therapy you're using. Um, what the stellate ganglion block showed is about a 10 point drop in GAD7 scores, which is over twice the minimally clinically important difference. Um, it's actually quite a bit because the, the GAD7 maxed out score is 21. Frequently, we have people come to our, our clinic that seek treatment and they, they'll say, well, I don't have PTSD. Um, and, and I'll say, well, here, fill out the symptom scores. Let's see what your symptoms are. Because to me, mm -hmm. that's more important. Again, back to my comment about, you know, the heterogeneity of the PTSD diagnosis. Um, again, it, it, the, if you look at uh, uh, the symptoms of P PTSD, they're all over the place. So what I do is I look at the actual symptoms. And if I see a lot of elevated hyperarousal symptoms on a PTSD, regardless of the total score, I know you're going to do well with a stellate ganglion block. If I look at your GAD7 scores and you have feeling anxious, nervous, or on edge maxed out at a three, and you say extremely difficult, that meaning how bad is this bothering you? Like, I know you're going to do well. Like I know it because that is the, that is the um, target of the stellate ganglion block, and it's going to be beneficial. Um, Let me give you a more, if I can jump in really quickly. Yeah, let's, let's make this a hypothetical. Let's mm -hmm. say there's someone listening that all of a sudden they're driving to the barber shop and they start to sweat. <laughs> And they go, oh, sitting in that chair and someone's cutting my hair. Or they're going down Ritchie Highway or Route 50. And then all of a sudden they go, oh, man, I'm feeling these physiological symptoms. And like, Ooh. or they're they're out to eat at a restaurant and then they get this whoosh yeah. feeling. And maybe yeah. it doesn't ever go to a level of a quote unquote panic attack. Yeah. Could this individual potentially be appropriate for this, this treatment? Yeah, well, definitely. Um, and I, I, I think it's a... Um, yeah. So yes is the short answer. Um, and I think backing what, that up what, with if, the reason, with the measurements. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's it because I think anytime you hear, you know, some doctor say, yeah, sure, this will help you. I think you really got to go back to that hammer and nail analogy. Oh, sure. Yes. The doctor's the hammer and everybody's the nail. What I think yeah. is I, I look at the symptoms and not the diagnosis. And if I can look at the symptoms and say, yes, I think that the stellate ganglion block will treat your symptoms because the final common pathway for a lot of things is this nerve is disrupted, whether it's PTSD or anxiety or panic disorder, generalized anxiety or acute stress response, or people mm -hmm. that are just wound tight and they've been that yeah. way since birth and they don't really even have a diagnosis. Yeah. Um, there are people like that walking all around us all the time. Some of them thrive in particular professions like first responders or some military mm -hmm. people do really well if that's the personality type. Um, but it makes it kind of tough to relax with your kids on the weekend sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that is a very appropriate thing to seek treatment where I say, is this, is this the kind of thing where I can just make my fight or flight system reset so it works properly? And to be clear, when we block the nerve, it wakes up again. And, be, and to be very clear on this, it wakes up um, functioning properly. Sometimes people think, oh, you're blocking the nerve. It's going to blunt my fight or flight um, response. Oh, heck no. If that were the case, it would be dangerous and, and we wouldn't do that. Okay. Um, and particularly if you're someone that needs your fight or flight system and you've honed it to a, um, a sharp edge, um, that's not at all what we want to do. I've done this on special operators two weeks from deployment to Afghanistan that have done wonderfully. And before mm -hmm. we did that, we studied it carefully, published our results to show that there was not a detriment. So this is one of those things where it's not like someone's smashing on your brake pedal. It's not even like they're putting a governor on your accelerator. Just taking your foot off the gas pedal mm. and letting it go back to where it works properly. Oh. <laughs> that's that's kind of the, the analogy that I like that yeah. I think makes sense to a lot of people. Okay. I'm going to briefly open up Pandora's box because... Okay. We're not going to go deep in this, but I want to open up Pandora's box. Okay. What about this modality, this treatment, this injection for eating disorders, addictions, other forms of diagnoses, conditions? Yeah. I'll try to answer yeah. that shortly. <laughs> yeah, there's a good one. I, I think I got a, a pretty good short answer to that. Now, um, and I hope there's people that are listening that are um, that are experts in disordered eating and substance 
um, substance abuse disorder, substance use disorder. And um, because it, it matters, the, the question is, how'd you get there, right? Like, how did you get there? What happened before? And without going too is fueling angst, anxiety, a discomfort and anxiousness that's either brain or body and your way of coping with it is one of these dysfunctional things, whether it's using substances or restricting or things like that, then it does make you wonder if we go upstream to treat the thing that's the root issue, um, what will be the effect? And I, I don't, I don't want to say too much because I think it would be, I don't want anybody to misconstrue sure. this. Dr. Yeah. Lynch says we can use SGB to treat yeah. alcoholism. What I will tell you is I have a, a good number of anecdotal responses from many of my patients who, after they've gotten a steli ganglion block, will write me a letter back and say, hey, doc, I don't really feel like drinking as much anymore. Or I don't feel like take, I don't feel like I have to take a, a gummy every time I go out or I have to go, to go to bed. And they say, have you ever thought about treating substance use with this or that kind of thing? And, and so I, and I have not, you know, explicitly, um, gone that direction. But but it makes sense to me that the same reason that people will use substances or abuse substances may have originated from anxiousness or anxiety, whether you want to call that a, a clinical diagnosis or not. And if that's the case, and we can reduce some of that that's living in the autonomic nervous system, that may have an effect. Um, mm -hmm. That's probably the best I could say, but I, I definitely think that that area is ripe for, for research. And there's no shortage of people that are hurting out there that could benefit. Yeah. And the listeners know my philosophy that we, there's a benefit of treating things holistically. The same examples you gave for PTSD and anxiety and treating PTSD in multiple facets, multimodal, if you will. The same thing with addiction or an eating disorder. Yeah, this can be one really important or advantageous treatment for the for the whole the whole thing yeah. Yeah. yeah that's great that's great um thanks so much i don't like to go past yeah. an hour so i think that's a good place yeah. to stop and, and i know you and i probably got a couple more things in our brains that we could talk about we um do. it might be helpful if i at least say what's on our website and where people could go to learn more is that let's okay? do that i'll put that in the yeah. notes too but please tell us about the stellate institute yeah well, I just, just, I think it's worth mentioning because I've said a few things on here about um, um, referencing things in the literature. It, on our, our website, we've tried to make things um, useful on our website, which is thestellateinstitute.com. It's the word the stellate, which is S T E L L A T E institute.com. But the the um, website has a few things on there. And, and on the FAQ tab, we've tried to make this useful for both patients um, and clinicians. And there's several videos, YouTube videos that are that will elaborate on many of the questions that people ask, like, what are the risks? What about this right side versus left side? What are, what are, where did it come from? What does it treat? What are the symptoms that benefit? All those things are kind of elaborated on a little bit more. But on the evidence tab, we've hung on there full text journal articles of all of our literature that's published. So, so I do say things like, hey, I, I, if you want to read the articles, they're there. And they're, you don't have to go searching on PubMed or have some access to a medical library. Mm -hmm. They're all hung right on there. And there's a summary graphics slide on there and everything. So if you just want to get a quick snapshot and say, all right, show me what's really out there in the peer-reviewed published literature. Um, and for something to stand peer review and get published, it's, it has gone through scrutiny. It's not like somebody wrote an article for a magazine or a leaflet mm -hmm. or a white paper or something. So we feel um, strongly that our, our evidence is on there. And I would point you to that as well. There's several videos on YouTube that you can look at. But really, our, our website, we're hoping to build and we continue to add to it um, things that will, can be helpful for people that are trying to learn more about the procedure. And there's a whole ton of testimonials on there. Um, there's a lot and a lot from people from very different backgrounds, whether it's anxiety or PTSD from all different backgrounds. Um, and just because um, I came out of the army, many people are under the misperception that PTSD is somehow a military thing. Mm -hmm. um, certainly there are those with military and veteran backgrounds that have PTSD. But in the U.S., that's really only about a third. 
two thirds of Americans with a diagnosis of PTSD come from a lot of other backgrounds. And really, I, at these days, at my clinic in in Annapolis, I treat um, probably more women than men by I don't know maybe sixty percent to forty percent. And uh, the vast majority of trauma backgrounds are probably. Um, not military, but I see a lot of childhood abuse and neglect and a lot of sexual assault survivors. And there are tons out there and don't necessarily have the advocacy groups that we see in the veteran community. So um, I, I want to make sure that's clear because sometimes people will look at my background and say, oh, that's an army guy. They take care of combat related PTSD. But no, it's, like I said, the, the stellate ganglion and the sympathetic trunk, they don't care. They don't care where the trauma came from. It doesn't matter. It's just biology to him. Um, and we're happy to happy to help with that. Yeah. And, uh, and I'll second that, that Dr. Lynch's website through the Stellate Institute is wonderful and, and easy to, to look at in terms of the Q&A, the, the empirical research, the videos. It's it's well done and can answer even more questions than we we touched upon today. So. Dr. Lynch, thank you for joining us. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot. Yeah. And, and in Appreciate closing, our, con our conversation with Dr. James Lynch has unveiled a promising frontier in mental health and wellness, the stellate ganglion block treatment with its potential to address both the psychological and physiological aspects of PTSD and anxiety presents a ray of hope for those who have long suffered, often in silence. As we explore the horizons of medical advancement, it's evident that collective solutions to health and wellness are not only possible, but essential. SGB stands as a treatment and a testament to the power of innovation, research, and compassionate care in transforming lives. We encourage you, our dear listeners, to stay informed about the latest developments in SGB and to share this episode with anyone who may benefit from its insights. Together, we can contribute to a world where mental health challenges are met with understanding, support, and groundbreaking breaking treatments like the stellate ganglion block. Thank you for joining us on this enlightening journey. And remember, when we come together in pursuit of wellness, we create a brighter and more compassionate world for all. Till next time, thanks so much.